Better? Yeah. Fantastic. By the way, for everybody in this room, you guys are going to find out real quick you picked a very good talk to come to. <laughs> so, you all good over there? Yeah. Fantastic. We're going to run through everything really quick, by the way. I love audience participation, so feel free to ask questions. As we go through it, if there's anything in particular, just shout it at me. I don't mind. So, this is getting hit by an 18-wheeler, privacy and anonymity in the modern age. Disclaimer, educational material, I'm not a lawyer, and if I sound like one, so seek legal advice elsewhere. Who knows what the C, C by S, A is? Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike. Perfect. What I use for all my content. Explicitly not covered by that <laughs> would be all the logos, trademarks like that, any taglines like that one, and anything else associated with any specific company listed, like this one, this one, or any of these. <laughs> it's most important that you leave with value anytime you come to a conference. So, one person, 30 seconds or less, if you have something that you really are looking to learn more about, or if you're facing a problem, go ahead and raise your hand and you have a room full of technology experts. Can anyone do it in 30 seconds or less? All right. I like to call this the red eye audience participation. There has been this lovely little logo in the corner since we started. There it is a little bigger. Can anybody tell me what's different about that eye? How about now? It's actually made up completely of ones and zeros. So there's things that are literally in front of you all the time that you don't necessarily realize unless you take the time to look at them. The reason I like to call that the red eye audience participation and the reason we have that lovely white table over there is because I like to call this the client friends in good company. So if you haven't read that yet, there are multiple objects on that table that these companies have provided me to give away during this talk. I wasn't compensated by any of them. I use their services. I'm going to give away prizes for good questions, additional input, and really whatever else I feel like. <laughs> if you win a prize, grab what you'd like off the table, snap a quick picture, and we have about $1,000 worth of stuff to give away. That's why I said you definitely came to the right talk. These are the five companies. So Zero Surge is a power protection company, and they make surge protection. Very simple. What that essentially means is that you would put these in front of your UPSs in order to essentially smooth out the curves. You could essentially send a lightning bolt through that, and you'd be completely fine. Those are about $200 a piece. Private internet access. Does anybody not know who private internet access is? Two people, perfect. They're a VPN provider, and we will get into what a VPN provider is later. Yubico, who is the creator of YubiKeys, has actually given me quite a few YubiKeys to give away as well for use with two-factor authentication. ProtonMail is an end-to-end -end encrypted email service. And then I also took two USB drives that are 8 gigs apiece, and we co-branded them and made them into Live Tails USBs. So you are, already have the work done for you. The NSA won't come looking for you because I already did the work for you. And we left the additional space on there. So if you want can, persistent storage, it's already built in for you. Is it safe to run tails off an optical disk because it, you know, it's read only? I mean, that gets compromised once and not in the USB. I can. You should never run tails off USB. <laughs> Go ahead. Also, how can I trust the integrity of said flash drive? He just said, how should I trust the integrity of it? Don't. I assume that there's malware on it. I'm completely lying to you. All right, we're going to do a quick introduction. We're going to explain what the differences are. We're going to give a couple top-level ideas, just things to keep in mind. We're going to do a little bit on tracking, what the different enhancement tools are, and then closing points to remember. So, about this guy. It's more like this. <laughs> This is a little story about how I went from being a software pirate to a freedom advocate. I like to call this story the death of the dino. In particular because that is about my skill level with GIMP. <laughs> so what ended up happening is many years ago, before the end of Photoshop 6, 
they essentially released Creative Cloud. Creative Cloud for those of you who don't know, continuously reaches out to talk to servers and make sure that you have the correct keys and all that fun stuff. What a lot of people don't know is that you can actually take any version of Creative Cloud products or anything that reaches out, download a copy of them, and so long as you firewall them off, you can still create key gens for them and have activated copies. The only issue is that you can't update them, so when they release an update, you have to find it again. What ended up happening was, at that point in time, I was like, this is really stupid. <laughs> I know there's alternatives that exist, and what was keeping me from actually transitioning was simply the time it actually took to use it. And for me in particular, like I said, I mostly just use it to crop stuff and a couple minor things, and that is probably the use case for most of the people in this room, assuming you're not a graphic designer. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation, but essentially, the free tools that exist are probably more than capable for your needs. So, who thinks that they have absolutely nothing to hide? That's a good thing nobody raised their hand. <laughs> All right, because that was the next one. That was something we were going to go over, but really, we have a very intelligent audience here. <laughs> so, privacy and anonymity. Privacy concerns the contents of your communications. So emails, text messages, whatever forms you're communicating in. Anonymity concerns your identity. So essentially, sender and recipient. Now there's use cases where you may want both, you may want one, or you may want the other. In our previous example that we're gonna pretend that somebody came up, I would have asked essentially for you to hand me your phone, and I would have said, what's the name of your wife, girlfriend, lover, et cetera? Because I'm just going to read up a couple previous text messages between the two of you guys. Don't mind if I read it out to a room full of people, right? <laughs> so when you're communicating with your significant other, you probably have to assume that you don't care if anybody knows who the communicating parties are, aka your anonymity. But you want to keep the contents of those messages private, which is where you want your privacy. Another example would be a whistleblower, because they want their identity to remain secret, but they want the contents of their message to be heard. So, top level one, know your adversary. Is it an individual? Is it a corporation? Or is it a nation state? For those of you who can't read that in the back, that says, I miss listening to your voice. And it's a little NSA van that says, me too. <laughs> That one is actually called getting hit by two 18-wheelers, dropped out of a plane, and set on fire. Or as I like to refer to it, your friendly government and you. Most of the stuff in this talk will not be related specifically in counteracting government nation-state adversaries. It will be on an individual and corporate level in particular. Top level two, if you aren't paying for the product, Unfortunately, I can't give away prizes for everybody for that one. <laughs> Raise your hands. You are the product. Top level three, logs. I love this one. If you don't have logs, you can't be compelled to produce them. If a company doesn't have logs, they can't be compelled to produce them. So know what you need to comply with the law and keep essentially yourself and your customers protected. If you don't need the logs, don't keep them. So we're going to head into tracking. Quick little thing, MAC addresses, IP addresses, etc. We're just going to go over them real quick because I assume most of the people in here know at least what their MAC address is. Unique browser fingerprinting, email collection, GPS. That's trilateration, by the way, not triangulation because there is a difference between them. Cellular, which is triangulation. Content delivery networks, and we're going to jump right into it. Media access control address. They are used for unique identifiers in the 802 specifications. So most of your wireless communications, anything you can essentially think that has a NIC more or less is probably going to fall under there. First three octets, there are six total, identify the manufacturer of whoever the NIC is typically. So that's also known as the organizationally unique identifier, or OWI. That's an example of Apple, Qualcomm, Atheros. They have more than just those listed, but that's just the two I pulled out of the example. Apple randomizes their MAC addresses in I.O. devices when scanning for networks. Does anybody know why they started doing that? Tracking prevention. 
Yes. Anything else? Broadway production? Say that one more time. Broadway production? Mm, there's a very, very specific use case. They did do it for both of those things. What happened was it was released that the NSA in major large cities was actually tracking people by their MAC addresses whenever they were actually transitioning through the cities themselves. So Apple decided in order to change that and help prevent against it, whenever your device actually scans for a new Wi-Fi network, it automatically randomizes it. Browsers. Everybody knows what a browser is. Just Internet Explorer and Edge, just know. Don't even bother with them. There's obviously a lot of other browsers and various different types and privacy-oriented ones, etc. We're just going to stick to the main ones solely because that's the easiest to go through. Who knows what a unique browser fingerprint is and wants to explain it? That guy raised his hand first. So basically it's a way of identifying your browser by the characteristics it reports to the websites and that stuff like, well, your, your uh, IP address is reported by the browser, but your IP address, your um, user agent, your uh, viewport dimensions, the languages that your browser will accept, the languages that it prefers, Perfect. For those of you who didn't get that, we're going to go over what he said essentially in a second. Please come up and grab something off the table. He essentially said it is a unique fingerprint that essentially tracks so they actually know what exactly you are doing and who you are. The types of things that they essentially use in order to track, <laughs> I like that one, is number of add-ons extensions, types of add-ons extensions, screen resolution, time zones, language, platform, fonts installed in the system, and whether or not it has touch support. There's more than that obviously listed, but those are the ones that I could fit and still make it readable. So we're going to get into a little bit of surveillance methodology. Interestingly enough, surveillance Methodology is relatively simple in and of itself anyway. And when I go through this, you're going to be like, that seems a lot less complicated than I would have imagined. Go something like this. You have an IP address. You match the IP address to a location. Traditional surveillance, such as camera monitoring, is brought in so they might stick a camera on the telephone pole across the street. And you just match the access logs with when an individual is actually present. Very simple. You know who actually used this recently? The US government to indict five Chinese government officials and provide attribution for attacks because what they found out was that they were only getting attacked during this very, very specific time frame. So what they did was they started watching, because they hadn't been before, some of the actual comings and goings of particular officers within the Chinese military. And what they actually did was they realized that only when these particular individuals were present were the attacks actually occurring. So they were able to actually provide attribution for it. This is the first time that the US government has actually provided attribution and indicted foreign military officials. Email collection, Gmail, AOL. Does anybody in this room use AOL? <laughs> <laughs> right? Interestingly enough, I have gone into a couple scenarios where I was like, AOL? You're kidding me, right? <laughs> Somebody's playing a joke on me. Yahoo. If it's, an, if it's unencrypted, it's being collected, parsed, and being used to build an ad profile on you. It's as simple as that. GPS. So GPS requires three satellites in order to determine a two-dimensional fix. It requires four satellites to determine a three-dimensional fix. The reason that is important is because we do not live in a two-dimensional world. So you need a signal from at least four satellites. The GPS system for the United States has approximately 22. This does not include military satellites, etc. Gloss, GLONESS, which is the Russian one, has another 23 satellites. And in addition to that, you also have the European agencies, you have the Canadian agencies, etc. So there's actually a very large number of GPS satellites you can connect to determining whether or not your actual processor picks up those signals. Most of the communication is done in what's an L1 band, which essentially means that those are the particular frequencies that your device, so when they say, oh, GPS isn't all that accurate, it's because it's accurate within XYZ. It's the code rate, actually. Say that one more time? It's the code rate, actually. L5 is like, yes. it's like LTE versus 2G. 
please grab a prize for that. What he actually said was that it is, in particular, like using the L5 bands, it's very, very small. And say that one more time. It's the. Huh? Oh, uh, no, it's the code break. It, it has code break. LP versus 2 bands. It a lot faster, so we can parse it at a smaller time and produce echoes. Perfect. That's exactly what I mean by providing very useful additional input. Can you repeat it? I can't hear him back here. So essentially what he said was that it's more like this. It's going from like 3G to going to 4G. That's the very, very short version of that that's condensed so that we can keep going on. Um, Essentially what will happen is the current processors being made will actually handle L2 communications to L5 communications, which means that you will actually be able to get a positioning fix within 30 centimeters, approximately. Next we have Google Maps because everybody loves Google Maps. This is your location history, so if you use Google Maps and you never actually turned off the thing that says save my location history, you can go back as many years as you want and see exactly where you were. Fun. I highly recommend to turn it off. Apple does the exact same thing. All right, who knows what that stands for? I'm going to give that guy in the back a chance. So the cell networks, uh, your cell phone actually identifies using an MT uh, or SIM card uh, for CDMA networks. Uh, the MT capture simply sniffs it. Perfect. Please grab something. So. What they essentially are is they are international mobile subscriber identity catchers. As he said, your SIM card is essentially used to help associate you with a network. Very simple, so it can identify you. Can I, can I ask something? Yeah, that, there's, yeah. that, there's a difference between that and your IMEI. Your phone has its own identifier, so you can switch yes. SIM cards to a new device, and they can still tell that it's you based on the SIM card. Correct. What he essentially just said is that the SIM cards themselves can actually be changed to swap devices as well, and there's a unique identifier for each particular one. There's going to be certain things that I'm going to mention that will be just slightly off because we obviously have a very wide range of technology in the audience. I am more than happy to sit down with anybody afterwards, and I'll make myself available if you guys want to talk about anything super technical. Stingrays. Not that one. The, not those. Sorry, guys. Stingrays. <laughs> so some modules, as they said, they connect to networks. What they allow you to do is to essentially track people's positioning. But Stingray models in particular, especially most of them, actually pull content, so text messages, email, data. It also makes it, interestingly enough, because you're no longer connected to the cell network, very dangerous because you can't make 911 calls anymore because your calls are being intercepted. Although the nice thing about them is that there's no discrimination. They collect everybody's information. So what ends up happening is when you have one of these stations actually emulating a cell tower, you essentially end up with collecting everybody's information. You can't target somebody specifically because otherwise it wouldn't work very well. So there's a couple issues. You have something in the back? Could this also be adapted as a kind of band the middle attack for cell phones? Yes, most definitely it can. <laughs> yeah, he asked if it could be essentially adapted as a man in the middle attack. Yes, it can. And then you have your baseband processors in your phones themselves, which are essentially the things that handle your radio communications. Does anybody know what we just found out about Apple phones recently? Yeah, you can't, you can't turn off uh, any of the antennas. If you turn it off, it Perfect. stays on. Please grab something. What he just said is that even when you have your Apple devices and you go to turn off one of the radio communications, like Bluetooth, for example, it's more so just like a little blinky light that you just turn on and off. It doesn't actually turn the radio communications off. Uh, hold on. So are you talking about iOS 11 and the switches in the control center, or are you talking about actually? The switches in the control center themselves will actually be more effective in actually turning them off. It is the quick ones, so the, uh, the quick usage of them. Thank <laughs> you.
All right, I'm going to let out a little secret here right now. For the most part, you actually really do not need to turn off your devices when you're actually on airplanes because they operate in very, very specific frequencies and bands specifically for those reasons. The reason is because if you have a crap load of people in a room and you essentially have everybody trying to pull in a bunch of signals and you have crosstalk between everything, it makes it more difficult. But they specifically have systems designed to prevent that. Yeah, so, yeah, no, no aircraft will get an airworthy certification of people having a cell phone on. Would prevent the, the, the reason the, uh, the service providers really don't want people in airplanes with their phones on because your phone can, from you know, like five miles in the sky, sees lots more towers than you being on the ground, and they just bounce around like crazy. It's actually really is taxing on their systems to have 300 people cruising five miles up, and you know their phones are constantly bouncing in and out of different cells. So it's actually more their problem than it is a problem with the. Thank you. Go ahead and grab another one. <laughs> I actually read it was either on Ars Technica or Hacker News that that's what they were recommending is using airplane mode because it does turn off the radio. I am not sure because I really don't work very much on iOS, so I can't answer that one way or the other. The problem with that is if it's in airplane mode, you can't make and receive telephone calls. But the use case, a lot of people say, I don't need to. It's a exactly. Apple. I'd like to save my battery, so I'll turn off all these things I'm not using. And then Apple says, "Well, no, we know better than." You. Now we think you we know what you want a little better than you do. Stay <laughs> back. I say that one more time. It does stay back if you turn a couple of things off. Uh, yes, it will if you actually turn them off via the control panel. It won't if you turn them off via the little on-off buttons. Yeah, they don't work. Center works control panel is close. Gotcha. All right, so the device in your pocket is always talking all the time. Just you can't really tell what it's saying because it's got a proprietary code base for most of them, which means that that's where we like to stick all of our back doors and all of our security holes <laughs> because there's nothing like having something that most people can't access to hide your security <laughs> features in. Next, we got content delivery networks. So CDN makes a request to the website. Anything that is geographically closer to it responds to the request, helps speed up web pages, so essentially your content is delivered faster. And a referrer HTTP header reveals to the CDN what pages you're looking for. Your IP address and your browser fingerprinting can be used to determine who you are by doing this. So damn extremists. Most of you guys in this room, I have to imagine. In 2014, there was an X key score configuration that showed you were an expected extremist if you searched for Linux, <laughs> IRC, Tails, Tor, and TrueCrypt. And if you did all of them, whoa. <laughs> I think I heard uh, an extremist. And no, this is not a joke slide. That is 100% that is accurate. <laughs> All right, I like to call this you watching your smart TV watching you. I did a little something special for you guys, and I got you an update on some of the new tech that they're going to be releasing in some of the next generation TVs. This is kind of what it looks like, and it says, now at the press of a button, right up in the little corner here, right where her hand is, you can go in and click that, and now they can watch you too. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, essentially, if you have a smart TV, it's probably watching you and taking pictures of you in your living room. <laughs> Maybe you want to cover it up, just saying. Also. Oh, that's my mother. Who put my mother in my slide deck? <laughs> <laughs> Question? What uh, is the rationale for smart TVs to be watching people over the ads? Why not? Yeah. Ads. Um, essentially, there's also things you can do with um, very high frequencies, so essentially what you end up doing is you put these high frequencies through the television, you can see who's on the other end of it, and your devices will essentially respond to what advertisements they've seen. So it's another way of actually tracking you through the advertisements. Could they be putting that in there for business people who use Skype, Skype and I'm sure that's what they'll claim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so also, uh, they claim for DRM, both the Xbox, Yes. And the PS2 for PlayStation to file patent. So it would have a camera looking back at you and counting the number of people in the room. And it would be just like your airport security 
you know, back to go, all of those pictures go back to the mothership. And I mean, they're not, they're not, they're not judged locally on the box. They're all going back to the internet, to Microsoft or Sony or whatever, going through a computer that, you know, sees see the frame of everything in your room. So, just like these laptops that they've sent home with high school kids that supposedly are modern service, you got a kid with, I don't know if the new ones have a camera looking back, but they apply for patents. And I assume for them. smart TVs now too. If you've got one of that, one of those in your child's bedroom, in theory, there could be some creeper, you know. Looking at them somewhere. That and, wa and watching your kid, or watching you. My understanding is that the only reason that people are contemplating camera and TV is that uh, it can be added to the home automation that's going on so that you can watch and you can use it, for instance, uh, as a, uh, a look back to see if somebody can eat on the street, that kind of thing. So you will have local control over the contents that will be shown. So again, there, it's kind of like uh, Lenovo laptops. Like, there's plenty of reasons that you could have things in there, but is there really a reason to have them in there? And particularly, I'm talking about the lower level firmware essentially calling back out. Default credentials, because everybody loves default credentials. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is my mother. And this is what my mother looked like when I told her she was going to be in my slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> And then when I showed her this picture, we started laughing. And the reason she's in my slide deck is because she probably has better privacy and anonymity than most of you in this room, and she is what I would classify as technologically illiterate. And she would agree with that 100%. So who knows what distribution she has? Let's go. <laughs> go ahead and grab some. <laughs> who else answered that? Grab some, my friend. All right, so. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> there we go. Start simple. Evaluate what your needs are. Evaluate what your family's needs are. And make a solution that fits within each of those person's needs. The reason she probably has better privacy and anonymity than most of you because the only thing she really uses her computer for is web browsing. So, if you give her a freer distribution, you don't have it talking as much back like Windows, for example. I love Windows because not only do you have to pay for it, you have to pay to be spied on now, too, and advertised to. That's fantastic in my mind. Like, I would have thought about that. Just like George Orwell would have been very, very disappointed that he was so far off. <laughs> So, panopticlick. Who knows what panopticlick is? EFF tool for accessing your browser's uniqueness from browser fingerprint. Fantastic. Go grab something. Yes, I am going to. So, it's a tool on a website by the Electronic Frontier Foundation that if you go and, and test your browser, it'll give you a score of how unique it is based on browser fingerprint. So, to repeat what he just said again, in case anybody in the back did not hear it, is it is a tool by the Electronic Frontier Foundation specifically designed to essentially see how unique your browser fingerprint is, how well you blend in. Because the issue with having a lot of different extensions, even if they're security extensions, is it makes you more and more unique. So now you stand out further from the actual crowd. Check it out against ad blocking, trackers, fingerprinting, and that's what it is. So panopticlick.eff.org slash tracker. And then browser extensions. Obviously, there's many, many more browser extensions than what I'm going to list, but these are going to be the quick ones. HTTPS everywhere. Who wants to answer what it is? <laughs> this little lady right here. It forces your connection to HTTPS for things that have a known HTTPS address if you accidentally go to the HTTP. Fantastic. She said what it does is it forces the connection. Please grab something, by the way. It forces the connection to HTTPS everywhere sites. So essentially, if it has the ability to, it will force those connections. Privacy Badger, who knows who produces Privacy Badger? And the guy's name. <laughs> I know it's uh, Noah. I don't know his last name. Cooper Quentin from the EFF. So 
what essentially that does is it follows you through different tracking. <laughs> they obviously have more people who work on it, but he's the lead, if you will. Okay. They have the Privacy Badger tracks everything, and if it sees a tracker on more than one website, it knows that typically it is not a first party cookie, and so it will essentially block access to those domains later on. You block origin, which essentially, make sure you get the origin version, is an ad blocking tool. And what it does is it collects a lot of different ad blocking lists, help to build them. And I am so surprised when I go to people who do not use ad blockers and other things like that, how different my browsing experience is from theirs. <laughs> It just amazes me. I'm like, how do you get anything done? Yeah. Then we have NoScript. Yep. NoScript, by the way, if you use NoScript, it will break most of the internet because it blocks JavaScript. So you got to essentially train it how you like it. And then self-destructing cookies. Personally, I like self-destructing cookies because even if you want to provide first-party cookies to a website, self-destructing cookies will essentially remove them as soon as you navigate away from it. CDN redirection. Redirects requests for the CDN providers. Since we covered the content delivery networks earlier, all it does is it intercepts the request and provides it back to local resources. Decentralizes. That is my favorite one. That was actually in Karen's talk yesterday as well. I don't know if anybody actually saw that or not. What they do is they bundle commonly used files and just serve them. As I mentioned, saves bandwidth, all sorts of fun stuff. Some of the supported networks, there's more than what's listed there. Those are just some of the main ones that are obviously called very frequently. And this is exactly what it looks like because it's much easier to understand from the picture. You have your little request here. Decentralized intercepts it as opposed to going to the CDN. Redirects the resource back. Very, very simple. Next we have Signal. Who uses Signal in this room? Everybody who did not raise your hand, I want you to download Signal later today. Um, I you don't like that? <laughs> go ahead, why? Uh, I'm not going to go into that. Just go on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we have obviously other encrypted apps, Wicker, Telegram, WhatsApp. A lot of people don't know who owns WhatsApp. Facebook. Facebook. Perfect. Who implemented the encryption scheme for WhatsApp. Who said that? Go ahead and grab something. <laughs> All right. So WhatsApp actually implemented Signal's encryption scheme. So in my personal opinion, I don't know how much faith you guys have in Facebook to not be tracking you. But personally, if I'm going to go with an encrypted application, I would rather have something where they got it from because there's actually very small changes that break the implementation because Signal is supposed to be more secure by default, so it chooses different user options than what WhatsApp does. Obviously, secure messaging app, encrypted communications, and then perfect forward secrecy. Who wants to explain what perfect forward secrecy is? You in the back. Double ratchet. Basically, every single communication is a re negotiated keys. Perfect. Go ahead and grab something. And to put it in very, very short layman's terms, what that essentially means is once you have one message sent, it changes the keys so that they can't read the previous ones, even if those ones are found. That's the very short layman's terms version of it. And then disappearing messages, which are just fantastic, because what that essentially means is that you can send messages to somebody. You can have them disappear because your device actually destroys the encryption keys for them. Key pass. This is going to be another fun one. Can I go back? I'll, I'll answer the question about uh, Signal. The, the one issue that I do have with Signal is that you have to sign up with a mobile number. Yes. Therefore, you get privacy, but you are inherently losing your anonymity. That is exactly it. So that is one of the trade-offs, essentially, for using Signal. And what this gentleman said was that you have to use a cell number in order to sign up with Signal. So what you are giving up is you are giving up your anonymity for the privacy portion of it. Same exact thing. Telegram too. It, there's so much reuse of cell phone numbers that that's not really that much. If you really were worried about that, you go up and get like burner Burner cell phones are, by the way, something that is not nearly as uh, anonymous as people think they are. Um, but essentially, for the messaging app, 
Privacy, some people want the privacy, some people want the anonymity. It all depends on what you actually need. Do I care whether or not somebody knows that I'm sending him a message? No. Do I want them to read the contents? No. <laughs> so for me, the anonymity is not important in that communication, but the privacy contents are. Key pass. Simple password manager stores your passwords. Do not type password or use something that is six digits or less with your password manager, because that is just terrible, terrible security. And you would be surprised by how often that actually happens. So KeyPass Droid is for Android. Mini KeyPass is for iOS. And who can tell me what the difference between LastPass and KeyPass is? KeyPass is a local application. keeps all your passwords on the, uh, the individual machine, LastPass being a web-based service. And Therefore, susceptible to compromise and disclosure. Perfect. KeyPass is also acceptable to compromise and disclosure, but you know, it's not from a web based application or attack that you're going to get that. Please grab something, by the way. With, with LastPass, you're trusting what that. Yes. Say, when they say okay. that they don't store your clear text password, no, right. you're, you're, I mean, you have to take it on faith. You don't have the way to verify it. Correct. So, what he essentially said the differences are. And to reiterate what this gentleman said, is that essentially KeyPass and LastPass, KeyPass is a locally stored copy slash database. LastPass is actually web-based, and so you have to trust that a third party is actually doing the appropriate thing. But if you want to use KeyPass across all your devices, store the database in Dropbox. Yes, there are many, many different ways you can actually store things everywhere. It purely depends on whether or not you have the technical applications and abilities to perform those and to make sure that you're actually doing it correctly. So security by itself is hard. Implementation is even harder and that's where most people actually fail. And now you're trusting Dropbox. And now you're trusting Dropbox. Right? Yeah. Uh, Spider Oak pretty good alternative to doing Dropbox. Spider Oak, he said. Yeah. Yes, that was a fantastic suggestion. If you have not gotten something, please run up and grab something. Could I get a time check real quick? Time check. Time check? It is 5.40. Perfect. Unfortunately, my uh, little buzzer reset on me earlier, so. F-Droid. F-Droid is essentially a repo for the Play Store, very similar, or I'm sorry, a replacement for the Play Store, except it only has FOSS apps, and if it does have other things like advertising, etc. It will make mention of them in there. Open camera. Is there an open camera developer in this room? I'm dead serious. I think that is a fantastic application and I was going to say please take two prizes because I love that thing. I use it all the time. Other things you have on there, document viewer, LibreOffice, Nextcloud, in case you want to roll up your own Nextcloud installation. Recommended email providers. Love these guys. ProtonMail. Rise Up. I like Rise Up. Who else knows who Rise Up is in this room? Anybody? Ever heard of Rise Up before? Okay, there are about three other people. So Rise Up is just another provider, but what they essentially do is they are very concerned with providing secure emails for people who are activists, people who might live in oppressive governments, and now, if I'm not mistaken, they might still only be by invitation code only. And personally, I would much rather trust my email, even maybe one of the emails that I don't care about as much, with somebody who has those principles than somebody who doesn't. <clears throat> Gmail. Um, <laughs> recommended email providers continued. Darkmail, Ladar Levison, who knows who he is? He had a encrypted. Uh, email solution that was being used, I think, at one point by Edward Snowden. And the FBI came after him and said, we want all of your decryption keys, and he just shut down the service and stuff. Perfect. Did you already get something? Please grab something. He when he provided the government with the key, but it was like printed in like... Yeah, it was actually printed out. <laughs> so, Ladar's company, LavaBit, as was mentioned, was the email provider for Edward Snowden. As opposed to giving access to the federal government, he essentially shut down the company. And as he just said, since they requested his key, he essentially printed it all out and was like, here you go. 
have fun looking through that. Now this is what gets me a little more excited. Dime, the dark male internet environment. Has anybody heard of that before? One guy in the back. What it essentially is, is Magma is a Dime-capable free and open source mail server. If you are running a mail server, I highly recommend that you check it out. And the reason being is because it actually, in its protocol, helps to break up the actual metadata itself during your email communications. Even if you have encrypted communications, metadata is still the weak point. This protocol was specifically designed in order to counter that. LavaBit actually just started business back in February, I think. So if you also want to make sure that uh, you have an email company who would rather shut down than give their keys to the government, you might want to check them out. Live USBs. Love these little suckers. Tails. Only way to run it. Rufus, if you're on Windows, because nobody here is on Windows, but you might know people, that's probably the best way to make them. You net bootin' or the DD command. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made those with the DD command. I only ruined half my hard drive. No, but seriously, don't use the DD command unless you really know what you're doing, because you will mess some stuff up. All right, let's get into proxies. Proxy, you, user proxy website. Websites, I'm sorry, I should say, yeah. The website will see the IP address of the proxy, not the user. Very simple. Proxy operator will be able to see all of the unencrypted traffic flowing through. And if they use encryption, they'll be able to see where you are going, but not necessarily what is in the tunnel. Most proxies use HTTP, HTTPS, and the SOX. Who can tell me what the difference between the SOX 4 and the SOX 5 is? The main name, or the main name. That is one of them. The number. The number. <laughs> Please grab a prize. <laughs> that was a good one. I like that one. All right. So the main difference between them is that SOX 4 is TCP applications only, whereas SOX 5 also supports UDP, DNS, and various authentication methods. Proxy chains. Super simple concept than you would imagine. No proxy, user goes to the web page, proxy, user, pro user, proxy, web page. Proxy chain, user, proxy, 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 web page. That's it. Virtual private networks. User creates an encrypted tunnel to wherever they're going. All the internet traffic flows through it, not just what it necessarily is in your browser, which is what proxies do. Unless you have a DNS leak. <laughs> yes. So what ends up happening with a DNS leak essentially is your traffic flows through it, but instead of sending your DNS requests through the VPN tunnel necessarily to your provider, who is your VPN, it might redirect outside of that and actually ask for it from somewhere else, hence compromising the integrity of where you're going. VPNs versus proxy. As I just said, proxies are designed to protect browser traffic, not everything. And proxies must be configured for each application, which is a pain in the butt, especially if you have a lot of them to do. And if a single proxy in the chain is broken, it essentially just crashes everything. Requests don't go through, so you need to figure out what's wrong with that proxy before you can continue using that particular chain. Free proxies and VPNs. But that sounds like a proxy chain is a lot like a Tor. I'm going to get into that in about two seconds. Oh. He just said a proxy chain sounds a lot like Tor. That's because it is. <laughs> proxy chains, or I'm sorry, free proxies, do not use them. Let me say that again. Do not use them. You are the product. If you are not paying for it and you are using some proxy service, unless you're doing research, you are the product. It is highly likely that they are collecting your browsing data to sell, and they are injecting something into your browser to monetize you. So do not use them. Now, recommended VPNs. TorGuard, private internet access. There are others that are definitely on par with them. These are the two that I particularly trust. And the Torrent TorGuard actually stands for Torrent, not the Tor Network. 
Now I'm going to essentially take back immediately what I just said about using free VPNs. Because Proton and RiseUp both offer a VPN service that is free on a smaller level. Those two in particular I would trust not to be messing with my traffic. And that's saying a lot. Proton VPN, by the way, does not currently have a recursive DNS within it, which means that your requests will go somewhere else. Private Internet Access, for example, and TorGuard, both you can channel the DNS requests through the VPN tunnel right within the configuration itself. So, again, there's things to consider, which is why even if you are using free VPN services, just know exactly what you're using. Tor. <laughs> Who does not know what Tor is? That's why it's regulated to one slide. Access through Tor Browser, Tails, works by encrypting each hop in the, in the proxy chain. <laughs> and it randomly, randomly chooses which servers it connects to. There's configuration you can do with inside of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, this is not a Tor talk because I'm pretty sure most people know what it is. The final connection point in the last relay can essentially be broken. And if it does not use any sort of encryption, it will be visible. Simple as that. VPNs and Tor, you can use them together. So if you have TorGuard, if you have PIA, and then you connect to the Tor network, you are essentially creating a first line of defense through your provider and then using the Tor network to access everything else. Main drawback is the connection will be slow. <laughs> so do not expect to be streaming 4K movies through that. <laughs> no, it was not designed for streaming movies and other things. And a lot of services that, that people probably commonly use give you a hard time if you're using yeah. crazy privacy stuff. Google hates it. They won't even really let you search more than one search before they'll block you. What he essentially just said is that what you'll encounter is a lot of companies will actually block requests from the Tor exit relays. Um, same thing with VPNs, honestly. Same exact thing with VPNs. So banking, you're probably not going to get away with it. But your bank, I imagine, knows who you are. You should you maybe advise just... people not to do banking over Tor. Yes. <laughs> you probably shouldn't be doing your banking over Tor. <laughs> just saying. Oh, All right. DNS translates IPs into human readable format. Who knows what those ones are? All right, then nobody's getting a prize for that one. <laughs> All right, and then we have domain name security extensions, DNS sect. Provides origin authentication. Authenticated denial of existence. So essentially, it doesn't give away the rest of its secrets when it's like, mm, that doesn't actually exist. It doesn't give away everything else either. Data integrity. Who can tell me what it does not provide? It does not provide encryption, availability, or confidentiality. That is where you get DNS script. Because DNS script was designed by OpenDNS to provide encrypted queries. Very, very simple. It's essentially the wrapper for the encryption. So what it does is you can essentially imagine that DNS script is the tunnel, and DNS sect sits inside of the tunnel. That's the easiest way to imagine that. There's a little list of resolvers in case you decide you want to go play around with them later and try and set something like that up. <coughs> DNS caching server. Personally, the reason that I would recommend putting a caching server on whatever laptop, because most of you probably run relatively strong hardware, and you can actually set up very, very small footprint caching services. I like DNS mask. Provides small ne network infrastructure, so DNS, DHCP, router, blah, blah, blah. This is literally how you get that running. It's four steps. Technically, if you don't test it, it's three. <laughs> <laughs> Just giving this gentleman a second to take a picture. <coughs> Multi-factor authentication, fantastic. Sorry, somebody just got a little hint there. Name all three of them for me. Done. Please grab a prize. Something you know, 
something you are, something you possess. MFA examples. PIN slash bank cards. Cell phone, SMS slash passwords. Or if you want to get crazy, you can do more than two, because it's multi-factor, as opposed to two-factor. And you can do things like free OTP, which generate soft tokens. So obviously time-based one times and HMAC, which is a hash-based one. And then you got YubiKeys. These little things are absolutely fantastic because what you can essentially do with them is you can leave them either A, plugged in if you have some of the smaller ones, or B, you can use them to essentially have in your computer. And when you want to use another verification method, you just push it. And you can essentially create a 60-digit random password that you can use to increase the strength of your already existing strong passwords. Because everybody uses a strong password in here, I assume. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> As he just said, he has an eight digit password. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Gentleman in the back. Um, is there any uh I know there is at least one or two out there. In my personal opinion, they are not up to par with what Yubico is currently offering, which is why they are in this slide deck and the other ones are not. Now, the one thing about that is that I believe they just or are going to very soon release an open version of them. In the meantime, if you don't want to buy one, Give the company a call and tell them you want a free and open source one. As far as I know, they're the only ones that also provide a key for uh, cell phones. Yes. So they also provide keys for cell phones as well. So you can do essentially um, who has an Android phone with a USB C? You can actually get a key to put into your Android phone. Same exact thing. Provides the same things. And it supports multiple protocols as well. They also have an NFC model. Yes, they also have an NFC one. I, I tried to skip over that like relatively quickly because otherwise this would literally have just turned into an advertisement for them because I would have been like, they're great, go buy some. That's why I just gave out a bunch of them. <laughs> Full disk encryption. These two topics can literally take up the entire talk, which is why this is going to be super, super high level. It encrypts your entire hard drive. Keys must be stored in memory for constant encryption slash decryption and hence are vulnerable to things like cold boot attacks. Linux unified key setup is typically what most people probably have associated with it. Next, you got encrypted containers. So you can use them inside of your full disk encryption. Veracrypt is personally the one that I like. Is there any that anyone else finds extremely easy to use that they would like to recommend? Veracrypt it is. The reason I recommend using encrypted containers inside of full disk encryption too is even if the device is off, and somebody gets a hold of it, let's say that there is an issue with either the implementation, which is significantly more likely, and they are able to get through the full disk encryption. That still allows you to have containers that are different, obviously have a different implementation, and have not necessarily been broken. Which is why I recommend using Veracrypt for the containers and not necessarily for the full disk. EncryptFS, you can definitely use it. I'd advise against that because um, if you have snap, can, if someone has uh, able to get a snapshot of it um, and you know go back and compare it, they can possibly get that. Right. That's true for full disk encryption too. Though. Yeah, what he essentially just said is that if you're able to take a snapshot of two of the different ones, you might be able to actually figure out what the encryption key is based upon what the differences between those are. Honestly, like I said. This is for mostly individuals and corporations. If you have to go to that level, you probably are in a significantly worse situation and should not be sitting in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Encrypted containers. For Veracrypt in particular, they're limited by the initial size that you set on them. And you can send containers via email so long as they are within the file size limit, which is fantastic. 
create your container. Let's say you are a small business and you have your books that you want to share with whoever your other partner is. As opposed to sending them in the clear text through Gmail or whatever provider you're using, create a little encrypted container because most of them are probably going to be under 10 megs for whatever book set you actually keep, assuming that you're not using um, anything that is going to be super large and sent elsewhere anyway. They're probably going to be done spreadsheet style. So you stick them in there, send them over email, and now your friend on the other end can essentially decrypt them and have access to your books. Yeah. You can also use this, someone mentioned with the key pass and drop files. Yes. Make a container that in your Dropbox so you can have encryption within it. Exactly. So as he happened to mention earlier, what this gentleman just said is that you can create an encrypted container. You can put your KeePass database inside of that container and then send it off to Dropbox. Again, that is implementation. Are we finished? Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. All right, let's do this. Good thing I'm almost done. Encrypted cloud storage. Go ahead and go through that. If you enjoy the talk, pick a project and contribute. That is right on time. Fantastic. <laughs> Code, dollars, documentation. If you contribute nothing else, there are a lot of projects that need good documentation. Spread the word. Thank you, guys. Closing points to remember. Just because you're paranoid does not mean they aren't after you. <laughs> Use FOSS. And if you want the slide deck, that's it. Thank you, guys. And I think we have a couple of them left. So anybody who did not get one, raise your hand right now. One, two, three, that guy over there in the back in the blue, then the guy wearing the horns. You denied it, so you don't get another one. You too, both you guys.